All right, it's at the top of the hour. I think it's time that we should get started. So we're actually broadcasting live from Las Vegas at the HR Technology 2021 show. And so welcome everyone to our third global town hall at SMA. We've been actually um, running a, a town hall for all of our employees now for 70 consecutive weeks. And this is the third event that we wanted to open up to any attendee. Uh, we, principally because of the number of speakers we have in, in this hour. It's going to be a, an exciting hour. We're actually going to start with the abstract expressionism art of, um, of Kandinsky. And Kandinsky was a friend of Paul Klee, who we covered in last week's art talk. And then we're going to have our main event. We're going to have a, an exciting discussion with Dr. Bernie Jaworski. He's the Peter F. Drucker Chair at the Drucker School of Management of the Claremont Graduate University. And then we're gonna finish up with a few laughs with the comedy of Colin Moulton. So let's get started and let's highlight Sarah Kane. Sarah, welcome. It's always great to have you on. And um, let's go ahead and jump right into Vasily Kandinsky and his art. Morning, everyone. Yes, let's jump right in. Okay. So Vasily Kandinsky was born in Moscow in 1866, but he was raised in Odessa, which is now part of Ukraine. And he actually studied law and economics and was offered a professorship at the University of Estonia. But all of a sudden he had a change of heart and began painting at age 30. And he eventually settled in Munich to begin his studies in 1896 at Anton Asby's Art School. And so there he was introduced to the avant-garde art scene at the time. In 1901, along with three other young artists, Kandinsky co-founded uh, Phalanx, which was an artist association opposed to the conservative views of the traditional art institutions. And Phalanx expanded to include an art school where Kandinsky taught at the time. And through his tra and travels throughout Europe and North America, Kandinsky was introduced to the more expressionist movement happening, which is when the artist paints using emotion and creative expression versus painting the literal image that they're trying to portray. And so with the introduction of expressionism, Kandinsky was able to find his own style. So this breakthrough work is a deceptively simple image. You can see there's a lone rider racing across the landscape, but it really represented a decisive moment in Kandinsky's developing style. Uh, in this painting, he demonstrated a, a stylistic link to the works of the Impressionists like Claude Monet, particularly evident in the kind of contrasts of light and dark of the sun-dappled hillside. But there's this ambiguity of the form of the figure on horseback. Uh, that's rendered in a variety of colors that almost blend together and foreshadow his interest in abstraction. And the other significance of the work is that it shares its title, Der Blau Ritter, with the name of the group of progressive artists that was uh, co-founded by Kandinsky in 1911. Can you get him? This. So Beach Baskets in Holland shows Kandinsky's metamorphosis again to his own unique style. So in this period of his career, he was focused more so on landscapes rather than human figures. And we can see that with the swaths of color in this piece that emulate a beachside scene. And But it's quite abstract and really can be interpreted by viewers to mean different things, which is what he wanted as an expressionist for the viewers to piece together and attach their own meaning and significance to his works. So this piece is untitled, but is the first abstract watercolor painting of his career. And we'll go on to look at many other of his abstract pieces kind of similar to this, but this really marked a change in his style and focus. Uh, Kandinsky was a color theorist, and obviously we can see the experimentation of contrasting colors kind of bleeding together, how the dark blue fades into a kind of gray and how the blue and red mix to make these different hues of purple. Uh, and this piece actually lives at the Musée National d'Art Moderne in Paris. So commonly cited as the pinnacle of Kandinsky's pre-World War I achievements, Composition 7 shows the artist's rejection of pictorial representation through this kind of swirling hurricane of colors and shapes. And the tumultuous forms around the canvas exemplifies Kandinsky's belief that painting could evoke sounds, the way that music called to mind certain colors and forms. 
And this is key to expressionism about what the painting evokes emotionally. Uh, even the title, Composition 7, is kind of aligned with his interest in the intertwining of the musical with the visual and really emphasize Kandinsky's non-representational focus in the work. So I'm not going to try and pronounce the German name of this piece, uh, but the English is color study. And as you can see, that's exactly what this piece portrays. Kandinsky wanted to experiment with how different colors interact together, uh, be it complementary or contrasting. And I think it's also really important to note that Kandinsky had syn synesthesia, so he could hear colors and see sounds. So I'm sure that this piece was speaking very loudly to him. Uh, so this piece is still abstract and expressionist, but Kandinsky's works became more geometrical at this period of his career. He was particularly interested in these kind of basic shapes, the circle, the half circle, the angle, the straight line, to bring those together to compose this larger piece. And we can see um, all of those interacting to create composition eight. And he painted this while teaching at the Bauhaus in Germany, the modern art school. And if you were on the Zoom last week, you remember that our artist Paul Klee was also teaching at the Bauhaus. And it was around this time when they became friends and collaborators. So as the title suggests, white is predominant in this painting, uh, including the background. And Kandinsky used white to represent life, peace, and silence. And the majority of the geometric shapes are presented in a variety of colors, reflecting his love for free expression of inner emotion. Again, it's that expression of emotion. Uh, but striking through this kaleidoscope of shapes and colors are these bold spiked barbs of black representing non-existence and death. And Kandinsky liked to paint while listening to music. And on white is his uh, interpretation of the music. So again, we can see his relationship with music and sound due to his synesthesia. And this piece is located at the Centre Pompidou, the modern art museum in Paris. So this piece was created in 1925, of course, with the primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. And this piece can actually be divided in half with how uh, different each of the sides are. So the left side has rectangles, squares, and straight lines in these bright colors, while the right side features darker colors in various abstract shapes. And so these two sides show different influences and are meant to create varied emotions in the viewers. And finally, Kandinsky painted this work in his 60th year, and it really demonstrates his lifelong and career-long search for the ideal form of expression and kind of spiritual expression in art. And so it was created as part of his experimentation with a linear style of painting, but this work really showcases his interest in the form of the circle. Uh, the circle, claimed Kandinsky, uh, quote, is the synthesis of the greatest oppositions. It combines the concentric and the eccentric in a single form and in equilibrium. Of the three primary forms, it po points most clearly to the fourth dimension. End quote. So this piece has kind of certain outerworldly or otherworldly aspects to it. Um, a few weeks ago, we actually did a whole art talk on space art. And this was one of the featured pieces uh, because you can kind of see it has this almost planet-like galaxy-esque feel to it. Uh, and so with this piece, he really plays with color, size, and placement to evoke both movement and balance. And so Kandinsky's work, both artistically and theoretically, played a large role in the kind of philosophic foundation for later modern art movements, in particular abstract expressionism, and then what branched off into color field painting. Uh, and so Kandinsky really set the stage for much of the expressive modern art produced in the 20th century. So uh, thanks everyone, and I will send it back to AJ now. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. Now, Sarah, which one of those was your favorite? I really like On White. Um, I just think uh -huh. the contrast with the, it really highlights the colors and those sharp black lines, having it be on a white background. I like that one. That's great. I like the circles. Uh, Bernie, which one was mm -hmm. your favorite? Do we have Bernie on? 
That's to give them a second to yeah. unmute. Yes, I like. I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up the order, but uh, yellow, yellow, red, blue. I think was the. <laughs> and, uh, so I love the way that blended together and, and, the, and the range they had. So uh, that was quite exciting. So thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Cool. Cool. Thanks, everyone. So uh, Sarah, thank you so much for an all of us informative and thought provoking. Uh, presentation. We're really looking forward to your art talk next week. We're going to actually feature the art of James Bond uh, as a way to celebrate the opening of the new James Bond film. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was excellent. Thank you. So let's uh, now move on to our main event for our discussion with Dr. Uh, Bernie Jaworski. He's the Drucker F. Um, uh, Peter F. Drucker Chair at the Drucker School of Management of the Claremont Graduate University. And prior to that, he was the executive vice president of North America for the prestigious uh, business school in Switzerland, IMD. And before that, he had a very successful, um, I think, a decade-long career as a global senior partner at the Monitor Group, which is now part of Deloitte. So welcome, Bernie. And, and Bernie, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of set the context for a minute uh, for our discussion. Is that all right? That's great. Uh, so Peter Drucker, the, the father of modern management, uh, wrote over 30 books. Uh, and our job in the next 30 minutes is to explain all 30 books to you. Uh, well, uh, that's a little bit impractical. Instead, <laughs> instead what we're going to do is we're going to summarize 10 principles of his work that do a pretty good job of holistically summarizing his perspective on management. And you'll see once we get through the 10 principles, how they collectively form a perspective or a philosophy around what Drucker termed functioning society. Drucker had a deep belief that organizations had a moral and ethical responsibility to do well, to touch society well, and to improve society through the nature of its product and services and also how it developed its people inside of that organization. So what happened is the Drucker School and the Drucker Institute, our sister organization, got together and said, we can't explain Drucker's work in a seven hour seminar. We gotta kind of make this fairly crisp and clean. So we came up with 10 core principles for for-profit organizations like SMA. But at one point in that process, I realized we need to have behavioral anchors. So if someone's gonna score themselves on a one to 10 point scale, it's hard to talk conceptually about scoring yourself without seeing a particular behavior the company engages in. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you each of these 10 principles. I'm gonna explain them and I'm gonna talk about the behavior anchors. So you kind of you realize you kind of score SMA on this principle. Now, all of you know that sometime this week, AJ and his team sent out a survey for you to actually score SMA. So what will happen is I will explain the principle, talk about the way to think about it, and then AJ will then kind of talk about the scoring that SMA had on the principle and whether there's room for improvement and how well we're scoring. Now, let me give you the headline. SMA scores very well as a drug of life organization. So just to be clear, the, uh, the overall... The overall scoring of SMA is actually quite high. Uh, so from the perspective of um, thinking about how we score as an organization, we've done, we've done very, very well. Uh, and uh, so we'll kind of go through these one at a time uh, to try and get at uh, what our scoring kind of looks like. So with that, Great. And, go ahead. Go ahead and Ber Bernie, if I can also just uh, make a few comments to kind of explain how we kind of got started on this uh, endeavor. And I see there's some feedback going on right now. So we'll try to see if we can kill that feedback. So, okay, so, so as I explained, we're actually broadcasting live from Las Vegas at the HR Tech of 21 show. And we've all known for a number of years now, there's been a lot written and spoken about uh, essentially the future, the future work and the new rules of talent management. Now, much of the discussion here at the show, at the show has really been about how the currency of work is changing from the traditional view of a job to essentially skills and the resulting democratization of work, the reduction of friction in organizations, and, um, and also the increased empowerment of, um, of workers taking greater control over their own careers. And so, Bernie, I mean, this sounds a lot like what Peter Drucker wrote decades ago about the knowledge worker, right? <laughs> Oh, it's exactly right. And uh, it's the evolution of the power of the worker and, uh, and, and what's happened. And, and really kind of what's, what's ultimately happened is Drucker had a deep belief that individuals should take responsibility for the nature of the work and, their, and, the, and the quality of the work and step up and actually talk about the idea of the contribution. What can I do as an individual worker to actually help deliver against the mission? But he also had a deep belief in self-control that individuals, particularly knowledge workers like SMA folks, should step up and take control for the nature of the work they do. That is, 
they take responsibility for setting the objectives and setting direction. And within that context, you should give knowledge workers enormous freedom to do their work. So it's not command and controls, the exact opposite. And I think what's happening in the COVID era is we're seeing an acceleration of this, this moving towards self-control and autonomy and allowing workers to kind of step up and take more responsibility for the work that they do. Indeed. And um, what's quite unusual about our firm, SMA, is that we were actually founded in 1982, largely based on a number of these ideas and concepts, which are now just essentially gained currency today, right? And so we actually wanted to evaluate how well we were doing against these ideas and concepts and the 10 principles of Drucker. And so we did the survey and we're going to actually now go through the survey results and, and go through each of the principles. So, so let's go ahead and share. Oh, go ahead, Bernie. And we'll share some slides. Fire away. Share screen. We're going. Just give us a second. Great. I think we have the first slide up. Okay, great. And AJ, you're going to have to cue me a bit because my screen just disappeared. But uh, I'm going to explain <laughs> number one, uh, and then I'll hand back to you. And then we'll kind of work through the 10 with the assumption that, that I cannot see the screen, at least for the time being. Um, so number one, clear mission and theory of the business. You have to have a very strong mission and cogent answer to a very simple question. What business are we in? And if we think about that, way over to the left side, you see a lot of firms that have very generic mission statements. We want to serve customers. We want to be number one in our industry, right? They're not motivating for employees. They're not exciting to be working at that organization. At the far end of this, the mission is very clear and precise. It focuses heavily on customers and what is the core customer benefit that we're delivering. It's not focused internally on our technology or how we do it, but instead it talks about the customer benefit. So an automotive company might be more about, not about automobiles, but be more about transportation, right? So you're trying to figure out what is the core benefit that customers are receiving from our offerings. And ideally, it also touches on society. Why would society benefit from us being in existence? And the important point of all this is that it's not just that it focuses on the customer benefit and has a really clear articulation of what that is, but individuals inside the company look at that and say, wow, this is actually very energizing for me to be part of this organization. And more importantly, organizations align themselves in a way that's consistent with the behaviors that are supportive of the mission itself. So AJ, your scoring here is, uh, is an eight on a 10 point scale. And quite frankly, having benchmarked this for a lot of different organizations, this is actually quite a high score. An eight or nine is a really good score. And the, the, the variance is, is reflected. I think this is one standard deviation out is the, uh, is the variance that's reflected in the line right there, uh, if I'm correct. Uh, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. that's correct. Yeah. So actually, I was quite surprised by these results. I had actually expected it to be higher, even though you're telling us that we scored pretty well. And, and that's because when our firm was founded in 1982, we were actually founded uh, to do one thing and to do that one thing really, really well, which is to help companies compete um, in their business. And back in 1982, that was really about kind of the front end of their business in terms of how they acquired new business. Today, we've actually evolved to extend the concept of improving our clients' competitiveness throughout what we call the entire program lifecycle, not just in terms of how companies think about their markets and customers, how they actually win new businesses, but also how they can think about how competitiveness actually plays a role in how they execute on the programs that they've won or execute on the business that they're actually engaged in. And so that's kind of, I think, perhaps softened up a little bit of our focus on mission. And what's interesting about this score is that... Uh, um, as perhaps not unexpected, individuals that have been with the firm for 20 years or more really, you know, scored as very, very high above nine to 10. Those who have just joined us within the last five years scored us lower. And the other interesting thing I want to point out here, which is actually true of almost every, each of these 10 principles, is that there was one subgroup and then the firm, which scored high, but actually more surprisingly, very, very tight scores. Uh, the standard deviation, I think, was less than a half. And that was our business development sales team. Wow, that's really interesting. So, I mean, you, and by the way, it's not unusual to get this type of variation. And in fact, and, and, and an important question to be asking diagnostically is, what is that we're doing to make sure that, that individuals actually comprehend the miss mission? And importantly, can talk about what their contribution is to the organization around it. So there's two potential areas mm -hmm. of, of, of flaw here. One is they don't understand the mission and what it's all about. Or two, they can't figure out how their role can be aligned to that particular mission. You know? So interesting point. 
All right. In the interest of time, AJ, let's pop on to number two. I do okay. have a screen back at this point, so you know, life is good again. Um, so this is a beautiful phrase. There's only one definition of a purpose of the business. It's to create a customer. He doesn't say serve a customer. He says create a customer. While accepting quality as a product or service is not what the supplier puts in, it's what the customer gets out and is willing to pay for. So this is the notion of being customer driven. I'm not selling this set of shoes. I'm actually selling this luxury good or this sense of comfort or whatever they make, a symbol of myself. There's many different ways that a customer can interpret what that is. So way over to the left, uh, you basically are launching products into the marketplace and you're the sales force and you're trying to you know, prime the pump to get people to actually buy this product, right? So it's very kind of selling orientation. Here we have an offering, we're trying to sell it into the marketplace, right? And we're out pushing company products. Instead, a really customer driven company wants to be way over to the right. We spend a lot of time and effort learning about the needs of our customers, thinking deeply about what that means, bringing that information back into the organization and agreeing upon here's where the clients are moving, here's where their care abouts are shifting and developing new products and new services to meet those needs. Not only new products and new services, it could be the case that SMA is looking at it and saying, here's an emergent segment or adjacent market we're gonna go for because we have the right capabilities to serve it. So not only is it around redesigning of our products and services, it could be questions related to where to play. Honestly, it could be questions also about shaping markets. And the Todd platform is a really interesting illustration of using market intelligence to shape the evolution of where markets are going. So really there's three things a customer driven company does. One is change its products and services based on the intelligence. Second is changing its where to play question with segments to bet on. And third is beginning to shape markets and the evolution of where competitive dynamics and customers are going. Now here the emphasis is deeply, deeply understanding your key target segment and understanding why they act and feel the way they do. Uh, and they're trying to respond with offerings that squarely meet the needs of that target segment. Yep. Selling is important, but what you want is products that sell themselves. So when SMA <laughs> is a set of offerings in the marketplace, people are knocking the door saying, please sell more of this to me. Uh, and so that's kind of where we want to be. <laughs> Looks like we're an eight again, uh, AJ, and with, with variance around seven, yes. nine, again, this is a very good score. So I'm just curious, you know, what your thoughts are about this. Yeah, actually, I was surprised at how high we scored on this. <laughs> and let, let me give a little bit of historical context. And so, first of all, I love that idea. I think we all wish we would have clients knocking on our doors, right? <laughs> and so, of course, it's a little bit more harder work than that. But um, so a little bit of historical context. Uh, when our firm was founded in 1982, we were actually just doing only one thing and we were creating customers around that one thing but over time we moved into adjacencies now what's interesting about our firm is that when we moved into adjacencies it was largely because customers asked us to <laughs> it wasn't because we had the brilliant idea to do so as an example i remember back in the mid 1990s we had helped um, customers and at that time a lot of our clients were in the aerospace and defense business they had won so much work with our assistants that they actually didn't have the program management and engineering talent to actually go execute on that work. So they basically asked our, the team that was helping them when to work, hey, can you just hang on for another six months or a year and help us actually run whatever it is that we want until we can get you know, our team onto the program. And so, hey, we said, why not, right? It sounds like a good business. <laughs> and so now that was, that was kind of offering a new service to an existing customer. But what today, I think one of the things I'm actually very proud of what the firm's been able to achieve over the 40 years is that we're not only serving just that aerospace and defense community, but actually we're serving a really a broad sector of industries. And it, it ranges from engineering construction firms, pharmaceuticals, um, life sciences, um, healthcare, to engineering companies, high tech, um, you name it. And that's kind of the process of, you know, for us, how we thought about creating new customers. And thank you for mentioning, Todd. That was actually one of the underlying principles. So about five years ago, we had we saw an opportunity to reinvent the firm. And part of that opportunity was also how do we scale up? How do we actually start to expand and create new customers in different fields? And so we felt that actually digital enablement of our entire business from end to end would at least give us the operating system in the company that would then enable us to actually think about how we can deliver services and create new customers across broader sectors. 
That's great, AJ. Let's go ahead. We have 20 minutes, AJ. We have eight principles to do, so we're going to have to pick up our okay. here as a uh, All right. as way through here. So, Drucker had a deep belief that what you want to do is push responsibility all the way to the front line because those are the individuals that are close to the problem, and you want to give them mm -hmm. discretion to understand kind of the offer of what we're doing and how to customize the work in order to kind of meet a particular offer or meet the needs inside the organization. So way over to the left side is command and control. We're gonna give people job descriptions and we're gonna tell them what they need to do. Way over to the right side is the exact opposite. All employees feel responsible and accountable for the success of the firm. What they do is they think about their boss's job, they think about the unit's responsibilities and deliverables, they think about the mission of the organization, and they take responsibility for articulating the objectives for their role. Uh, and thinking about the job requirements and then have the discussion with their boss and then they reach a mutual agreement about how to deliver uh, against the overall mission given the strengths of that particular individual worker, right? So all employees are responsible and accountable and take ownership and self-control to hit the particular targets that are established for that particular position. Once again, as a, this doesn't surprise me, AJ, that you're an eight because of the nature of how you organize yourself. I might have expected yeah. nine, but, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. <laughs> I, I actually felt the same way as you, Bernie, on this. And what, what's interesting about this is, um, is that I relate this to a lot in terms of what's being um, talked about today in terms of uh, the new generation of workers and what they're really looking for in terms of their careers is a lot more autonomy, right? And it's not just autonomy about where they work, it's autonomy about what they do and how they do their work. And uh, again, another interesting characteristic of our heart firm was founded in the original individuals that kind of set the culture of the firm was really about that very high level of autonomy that we had uh, given to our employees because there was a high level of trust. And with that came responsibility and accountability. And also, I think part of this is because we had such a clear mission about what we were supposed to do for our clients. Yeah, all of these, by the way, for those that are listening in, think about the, I'm going to walk through each principle, but think about the collective integration of these principles, because that's kind of the big, the big idea that's here. In the interest of time, let's move on to number four. Okay, and we are okay on, on time. We just did a time check, so we're good. Okay, great, great. Um, so Drucker had a very deep belief that every organization was responsible to develop every individual. He felt that people were the most important asset of the organization, and one that depreciated the fastest and was invested in the least. So he had a really strong point of view. You're either developing them or you're stunting them, right? So way over to left, there's very little emphasis on employee development, very little training programs, really little ro job rotation, not much mentoring going on, not just diagnostic testing to find out what's going on. Way over to the far right side, an organization develops programs uh, around professional and personal development of its employees. It's viewed by everybody as world-class, the best in the industry. You've got very deeply loyal employees that are really developing and growing much faster, the way they think, much faster than their cohorts and other firms. Are you learning and developing faster than your cohort that's in another organization? Typically in these organizations, the employees are targeted aggressively by competitors and others outside the industry because I think there's some magic that's happening. So here, we're a little lower on our score. We're back closer yes, we are. here and uh, curious uh, age. is still a good score, but curious what your thoughts are here. Yeah, I think for the first, uh, I mentioned, you know, our firm is 40 years old, right? I think for the first 20 years of our firm, I would have seen scores if we had the survey and uh, I would have seen scores, I think between nine and 10 on this point. So this is an area that we really do need to work on. I would really love to see us kind of figure out how to improve this and move this into the eight to 10 uh, level. And I think this is an area which we probably underinvested in, frankly. And, and, that, and part of that came with, I think, the growth of the firm. Yeah. And I would encourage you, AJ, to think broadly. So even though we mm -hmm. tend to talk about training and learning and development, it's everything. The right mentoring, the right job feedback, the right type of new opportunities, the diversity of opportunities, who you work with. Uh, the issue, fundamental issue to ask people are, are they growing? Are they developing? Are they, are they yeah. learning? And how fast are they learning? Uh, and, and speed of learning often distinguishes the uh, knowledge uh, worker. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned mentoring because, in fact, I think that was the, been the key hallmark of our firm, particularly in the first 20 years. We were able to structure our projects and how we delivered our services to clients where there was built-in mentoring in terms of the leadership team that we provided on the projects and how we thought about each individual. That's probably something – I'm glad you mentioned because that's probably something that we've actually gotten away from a little bit. So, that's, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be taking some notes about this. <laughs> All, right. All right. Sounds great. Appreciate that. Uh, 
So number five. So innovation is not just the responsibility of the R&D department. You know, it's kind of most organizations that say, what, what, you know, what are you doing from an innovation perspective? They tilt over to R&D and say, what's R&D doing in terms of new products, new efforts, and everything else? And if you think about aerospace and defense, that's kind of way I think a lot of people think that's, it's those guys over in R&D that are kind of doing it. But Drucker had a deep belief that when organizations innovate, they innovate everywhere. You can have an innovative IT department, you've got an innovative HR group, you've got an innovative supply chain, innovative operations, innovative marketing, innovative supply chain. Everything we do the touch in is an area for innovation. So, uh, uh, if I can ask you just to pause for a second, I think we've got some um, feedback going on, or if we can ask all of our audience members to mute, that'd be great. Go ahead, Bernie, sorry. So, um, yeah, so the main point of this scoring is you dedicate our R&D group that think they're going to be but it's largely focused around the products and the offers that we have. And, so, uh, and I'm not quite sure where it's coming from. But, um, AJ, you need to mute Patty. It's Patty. Excuse us for a second. Uh, members. Yeah. So, okay, I'm going to speak over the crowd uh, for a minute here while we're muting. Uh, and think of it this way. Every individual has a responsibility, but it also means that every single manager has to listen to employees that have responsibility, right? So, this is everything we do. This is from our financial model to the alliances that we form, to uh, the products, the services, the innovation, to our brand, to the client experience. Everything we do. Uh, relates to innovation. And so the scoring for this one should be reflective of not just our products and services, but everything that we kind of do. Now this one, AJ, let me just say the following. I'm kind of surprised. I thought you guys would be higher because I think of Todd as the reinvention. I would have put you guys in a nine, a nine in this one. So I'm kind of surprised we're back closer to seven. So I'm not sure if, if you can speak to that issue, AJ, as to why you think we may be back closer to seven than at nine. Yeah. I actually would have expected a much higher score as, as you did, Bernie. And I think it's perhaps that we haven't done as good of a job in communicating um, what we've been doing as a firm in terms of all of the innovation that we've actually been incorporating into the firm. And it's not just innovation around our products and services, it's about actually largely about how we operate as a firm. And, and it's been, I think, actually revolutionary and disruptive in our industry. And so we've obviously have not done a great job in communicating this to our employees, whereas perhaps we've done a much better job communicating it to our clients. <laughs> Well, what's interesting here too, AJ, is it depends on how people think about innovation. People may even think about innovation in terms of core products and services, maybe. And yeah. they might say, well, there it's kind of, we, we, we have our standard fare, you know, blah, blah, as opposed to thinking about the overall platform that kind of reinvents kind of everything. So it, it may have depended upon, without knowing the qualitative responses, it may have depended on how people kind of cut in around it as to what our score might have been. Right. As, as some of the work that we've done together when we we're at the monitor group, you know, we have this concept of the 10 types of innovation, which spans across almost every aspect and element of a business. It's not just uh, your products and service offering, it's how you serve customers as well as how you operate as a business. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and hit number six. Okay. okay. So this is the most difficult principle to score well on out of all the ones we're gonna talk about. Organizations hate to abandon things. There's always somebody who's advocating not to drop product A or not to product IT system B or not to do HR system Y. It's very, very hard. What organizations typically do is they throw everything on top of everything else they're doing and just keep adding stuff. <clears throat> but if you think about innovation, the only way that you can innovate deeply is to get rid of a lot of stuff that's on your plate. So let's say SMA is allocating 100% of the time and effort to doing activities. If you could say eliminate 50% of what you do, <clears throat> all of a sudden you've created space to have innovation. So abandonment and innovation go hand in hand. If I don't abandon everything and I'm operating at 100% level and I'm saying, let's have this brand new innovation come on top of it, the organization struggles a bit. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to manage this because organizations love stability. They don't like change. Now, the question really becomes, can we find organizations that are just running their same business model and all they're doing is just refining their business model over time? And so they have, a, they have a way of doing it, and all they're doing is fine-tuning it. A good example would be Blockbuster. <clears throat> Blockbuster did a great job of operational excellence of its stores. Problem is that there's something called streaming media, right? 
Netflix, on the other hand, has reinvented itself at least four major times over a 20 year period. A great illustration of a company that's moving from DVDs to content, to streaming media, to ultimately being a production house, right? So the question really here is, <clears throat> have we reinvented ourselves? So once again, AJ, I will give you a higher score than it looks like your team gave you. Yeah, I, I think the uh, same response for me as well. And perhaps it's for the same reasons that, that we were speculating on the last one, which is it's really more mostly a failure of our ability to communicate uh, what we've not just been doing new, but also what we're no longer doing. And I actually think the list of the things that we're no longer doing is much longer than the list of things that we're doing new. And I think this is a real challenge. And by the way, I would challenge people on, on, the, on, the, on the Zoom call right now to ask yourself about yourself individually. Let's take my last year. Am I doing 100% of the activities I was engaged last year? Am I doing the exact same stuff this year? So I'm just carrying over my 100%? Or are there some activities I've truly looked at and said, I'm not going to engage in those services anymore. I'm not going to engage in this way of working. I'm actually going to move into these adjacent spaces, right? But to do that right. well, you have to delegate. You have to, get, you have to get rid of certain activities. And willingness to do new activities is also challenging because when you run these experiments around new activities, you can fail because they're new, right? So this, there's, a, there's an inter interesting level of analysis issue. We've been operating at the SMA level, but as we transition to principle number seven, please ask yourself of this. Are you abandoning stuff that no longer makes sense for you to do because you've either developed deep expertise and you're not learning mm -hmm. or that issue that you've been working on is actually losing its, losing its significance and it's been migrating to a different format, right? So we should be asking ourselves individually about this question also. <clears throat> I do exactly, and if I think, Bernie, uh, I just want to mention to the audience, please go ahead. If you have any questions, uh, put it in the chat window and we'll try to address them. I think we do have one, AJ, just came up. Let's see, what is next as the key to maintaining and improving great scores? Ah, oh, why don't we hold off to that until we finish all 10? How about that? <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on to, to uh, seven. Seven. All right, we're on slide seven. So organizations love to, love to uh, look at activities. Are you following this process? Are you following this workflow? Are you doing these seven steps, right? But what Drucker argues is that that's not really, that's really not the measure. The measure is what is the performance outcome of the role that you're performing? Now, the beauty of this is that if you look at folks in sales, it's pretty obvious. At the end of the month, <laughs> they have certain revenue. But take a look at the HR function and take a look at someone who's responsible for learning development in the organization. What is a measure of impact for someone who's responsible for learning development in an organization? It's very difficult to articulate that. It's not the number of programs you have. It's not the number of people you train. Those are all activities, right? What's the outcome? The outcome mm -hmm. is want to change the behavior of individuals in that role. Well, how do I measure that? How do I assess that? Do I pre-post test that? Do I run? So it's very difficult to kind of focus here. Now, at the organizational level, which is what this is all about here, what we want to be able to do is not simply look at financial results, but a high performing activity looks at multiple measures. And whether you wanna call it a balanced scorecard or other different things, you label it. But I wanna look at overall, are my employees satisfied, happy, engaged? Are my, are my customers more loyal, more satisfied, more likely to refer others? Are my shareholders happy with what I do? Am I impacting the community? Am I touching society? Am I improving the world that we live in, right? So it's a holistic understanding more broadly of what the impact does to the organization, not just internally, but the impact on the marketplace more generally. And here, AJ, you know, you're kind of closer to seven. I'm not sure what you would think here about this score. Yeah, I think what's interesting here is that the standard deviation was considerably uh, wider than for the rest of the principles. And perhaps not surprisingly, because, you know, we opened up the survey to everyone in the organization. And I think this may be, as you mentioned, a very easy thing to do for a sales team. Not so easy thing to do for other you know, elements or functions, departments within our company. And so I actually think perhaps all the 10, from my perspective, Bernie, this may actually be one of the hardest things to really accomplish at a firm. And I think it's because the roles are roles that it's unclear what the result is for that role, right? You know, what is yeah. that, what we're gonna put in place? For your IT group, is it 
the time at which they get the job done? You know, is it hitting the milestones? You know, or is it, what does it mean to actually, that's not it, right? It's some level of the idea of the productivity of the IT system should support the individual. How do I measure that? You know, is it a perceptual measure? Is it an objective measure? There can right. be some objective measures. If you look at Todd, length of time it takes to put together a proposal is a pretty objective measure, right? But it is a process measure. It's not an outcome measure. So it, it, it is yeah. complicated as to how to get there. But this is, this is an important one, though. you got to be asking yourself all the time, what are the results? Not is it how they actually get the work done. Okay, uh, number eight. Ah, uh, so... The Drucker's, one of Drucker's most important ideas was every organization has to manage continuity and change. You have to manage the current business and run the current business and, and, and run it well, run it operationally well, extract as much revenue and profit as you can from running the existing business as is. And then at the same time, you have to be spending, senior management should be spending, according to Drucker, 15 to 20% of its time in the future. What is the world going to look like three, four, five years in the future? Uh, Drucker had a point of view that oftentimes it's valuable when you have discontinuity to set up a separate unit to actually do this activity because the measurements are necessary to get to the future are very different than the measurements. So short run, you're looking at you know, productivity, you're looking at utilization, you're looking at margins, not the right thing to be looking at if you're managing a business of the future. So he believed there oftentimes are two separate organizations, right? Certainly that's what Netflix does, right? They have manager DVD business, mm -hmm. which it's a very large business. They manage it separately than this. So for, for someone like for someone like SMA, it would be pre-Todd would be managing the business you know, in the old way, and post-Todd would be managing business a different way, right? But also, funny enough, that right. now the challenge for AJ and, and, and Jock right now is, hey, we're there with Todd. So now what's the future look like five years from now, given that we have Todd, right? So you got, you, even though you got to the future and you've reinvented it and you've shaped the evolution, you still have to be thinking about these two time periods and managing what's the next generation going to look like <laughs> well all right so we just got to the future now we have to now next think about the next future right bernie <laughs> A lot of and this right? is yeah <laughs> the, the work the hard work never ends right <laughs> and so i think um uh, this is this is interesting. Uh, this one particularly was was thought provoking for me because this really ends up being, I think, the primary responsibility of the very top leadership of the firm, right? And, and and this is truly a hard thing to do because you have to deliver results, you know, every quarter, every month, right, to the shareholders uh, and to the employees, actually. And and yet at the same time, you've got to be able to carve out and really think about well, what do you want your firm to be in the future? And as Bernie, as you know, in terms of work you've done with us at SMA. You know, we, we've just kind of finished a, a, a three-year reinvention of the firm, right, which is really about us reinventing who we are and repositioning ourselves in the marketplace and essentially be trying to become a market, a market maker again. And that's about how to think about how professional services are delivered in a very different way. Now, thank you for that, um, for that uh, reminder to us, to Jacques and I, that now we have to now go beyond that and, and actually think about the next five years out. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, there, there, there's really interesting questions around things like monetizing uh, Todd and other stuff. So, so there's, yeah. a, there's a pathway there, but it is, you know, it's kind of, it's a little frustrating. Now, some firms uh, migrate in a very continuous way over time, but from some firms like SMA have discontinuity. And for me, Todd's a discontinuity. We did it this way, we're going to do it that way. You know, it, it, discontinuity would be, we've historically been in a DVD business, now we're a streaming business. Those are discontinuity. Right. For some businesses, the evolution is much more simple and much more, you know, progressive, but it doesn't have this big discontinuity. So we do have a particular challenge uh, that's a little bit different here. All right, let's do principle nine and then 10, and we'll say a few words here. Um, so Drucker had a very deep belief, this is right back in the 1950s, that you had to have values. Organizations needed values like the body uh, needs vitamins. It's the lifeblood. People join organizations because of their values. It's like-minded in terms of how I like to work. If you're serious about it, if you're serious about values, it is the North Star that guides the firm. The firm regularly talks about its values, regularly talks about behaviors that are consistent with the values. It's not unusual to have performance reviews that have a nine block diagram of high, medium, low performance. High, medium, low lives the values, right? And if I'm being evaluated each year, then I better know what the values are and I better act in ways that are consistent. There's nothing better than looking at an employee and singling them out for not living the values and having some sort of reprimand that's in place, right? In the same way, also rewarding people that live the values, right? So you've got to reward right. 
course and talk about the values. And here, AJ, we're at 7.5, which is pretty good, but probably could use some room for improvement. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about this one. Yeah, indeed. And um, I think, uh, you know, over our 40 year history, we've probably would have scored quite, uh, quite definitely over those 40 years, uh, depending on kind of who the leadership team was at, at the firm and what the firm was focused on at that time. I think we've recently have just started to re uh, renew our focus on the firm's values. Uh, so we started that several years ago try to be very clear in terms of what those values were and the principles of our business. I actually think the most important thing here is, is demonstrating that we're actually enforcing the values. And that's, I think 20% of this, of this challenge is not just stating what the values are. I think 80% of the challenge is actually enforcing those values. And, and, and that's probably, I think, where you know, the, the message to me is to, we need to do a better job at. All righty, uh, our last one, and then we should probably uh, close out after this interview with a few higher level okay. comments, um, is organizations have a moral and ethical responsibility to contribute to society. This is Drucker's point of view. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the fact we have a CSR department or that we're doing corporate social responsibility stuff. It's everything we do should be judged in terms of how it is that it impacts functioning society. So in the far right, organization deeply uh, embraces social responsibility and impact on how we uh, impact society. Employees and leaders join the organization because it takes this very seriously. It's not a slogan or catchphrase. They believe uh, in it and behave in ways that are consistent with the idea of being socially, moral, morally, and ethically responsible for society in terms of the impact that SMA has on everybody we touch in client organizations and in shareholders more generally. And here we're, we're scoring a little bit below uh, seven with a big, bigger variance here, uh, AJ. So thoughts about yeah. that? Yeah. And, and perhaps this is the one which we haven't focused as much on very explicitly. Uh, perhaps we've done it more implicitly in terms of some of the things that we've invested in and, and how uh, the leadership of you know, our firm communicates, uh, not just to our employees, but also to our customers. Um, and, and this is actually one which... Um, I think it's a hard one because it's it's hard to first of all define for a firm what that social responsibility really you know should be right, and, and this is I think goes beyond just kind of being charitable. Uh, there's much more. So this isn't just about being charitable from a financial perspective. This is actually being charitable about what your people are engaged in uh, that actually help improve in terms of uh, kind of you know everyone's social well-being, right? So this is one which uh, we're going to need some help on, Bernie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I'm selling services now. I'm moving into proposal mode here, uh, AJ, as the... Uh... <laughs> yes. All right, so listen, guys, uh, there's, there was a question. We have a minute or two left here. There's a question, yeah. um, where do we start? How do we think about improving? Let me answer that question very concretely. Uh, if I'm looking at the scores over here, the very first thing and the most important scoring that you can have <laughs> is around two things, two, two elements here. Number one is customer centricity. Are you customer centric and where do you score there? Because everything works off of customer centricity. If I'm deeply customer centric and I'm providing products and services that people love and are willing to pay an enormous price premium for, that sets the stage for developing employees, reinventing the firm, abandoning certain things, innovating and so forth. So step one is customer centricity. But step two, and the reason they have to be done in parallel is you have to have everything being mission driven. The organization has to align to what is the overall customer benefit we're gonna to commit to over a two decade period. And so you have to have the mission aligned with customer centricity. So if you're asking me where do we start on the journey, I would say we're going to push those as far to the right as possible, and then we're going to pick up from there. So my two priorities would be driving customer centricity and driving a mission. And if it feels like we're an eight or nine, I'd say that's kind of close enough, and then I'd work to the next level down from there. But, but the central premise of a lot of this work revolves around customer centricity <laughs> as well as mission. So that's what I would start the journey. Right. Thank you so much, Bernie, and thank you for uh, for sharing your time with us. This has been fascinating, and I'm sure our audience members, there's a lot of comments in the chat window, so it's been a, a fantastic session. Bernie, we're looking forward to having you back at one of our future town halls, and um, absolutely looking forward to having more conversation about how we can improve our scores. <laughs> well, importantly, I should have, I've, got my, I've got my Todd shirt. I've got the exact same white shirt you have. I should have been wearing that. I'm not one with the organization. <laughs> So next time, <laughs> I will wear the appropriate wardrobe, all right? <laughs> exactly. Thank, thank you so much, Bernie. It's, it's, it's been great. I really appreciate it. All right. So now we're going to actually move on to the comedy of Colin Moulton. 
and have some laughs as a way to finish off our global town hall. Now, Colin has worked with the greats like Robin Williams and Dave Chappelle. He has his own special on Showtime and has been featured on Comedy Central. And uh, really, welcome back, Colin, and let's give him a big hand. Give us a second. We'll get Colin queued up. I missed you, my SMA crew. You. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you guys. This whole old guard, new guard thing blew my mind because to me, SMA is new guard you were the reason they, you guys headed up the way for virtual entertainment to me you led the way for virtual entertainment because i got this phone call a lot of you guys may not know this i got this phone call one day from my agent they said this group of people this this group of associates this uh company uh they they want to they want to have virtual entertainment they want to buy a block of events and they want to raise morale for their associates because they had to send them home and so they're probably very sad at home and not not at work with with the, with the executive staff. So they're so sad that, that they want to raise morale. So I said, okay, great. So I got on this call with AJ and Jacques and Melissa, and um, and they said, do you know how to do Zoom events? And I said, yeah. So we looked at my Zoom setup, and they said, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And I said, no. And they said, great. That's how we start our relationship with every single client. This is exactly what we do. So they helped me dial it in, and we started – doing town halls so that we could raise morale for the associates. And I realized a couple of town halls in that everybody was so happy and joyous because they were at home with their alcohol, their dogs, and their snacks. And, and the, the morale was only low with the executive staff. We were raising morale because for AJ and Jacques and Melissa because they missed you guys because they, they, their morale was low. <laughs> This is technically an intervention for Jock, by the way. That okay. Technology. Uh, th this whole shift has been a challenge. I don't know if you know this, but Jock used to think he had to call me first to text me. So he would call me and I would answer and he'd go, oh, hey, there he is, and and start texting at me while I was on the phone with him. And I'm like, Jock, I'm on the phone. And he goes, stop, you're ruining my text. I can't text with you talking. <laughs> <laughs> and texting is, for me, autocorrect is ruining my life. This is the problem with texting. It's it, because my phone knows I'm old. So it doesn't put up with this newfangled abbreviation stuff from me. Like my friend the other day said, uh, texted me and said, I'm sorry, I was late the other day. And uh, and he was being very forthright. And I said, uh, oh, great, uh, NP, which is an abbreviation. Uh, AJ Jacques, we'll go over some more abbreviations later just to catch you <laughs> up. But NP means no problem. And so I texted all cool and hip, NP. And my phone was like, you don't talk like that. And uh, and then it just weeded through its memory of how I do talk and texted capital N-O. No! Nah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how sh that was the exact opposite of what I was trying to tell him. How shocked was my friend when I screamed no at him <laughs> for apologizing for being late? <laughs> These abbreviations, I try to stay hip. And I just, I, I, my I try to know them, but my, like I said, it autocorrects. Like, for instance, you got to know them. AJ, LOL means laugh out loud, not lots of love. So the next <laughs> time somebody texts you uh, about a tragic situation in their life, they had to put the dog down, and, and the wife's ailing mother is now living with us. Oh, my thoughts are with you, LOL. I'm laughing at your despair. Don't put, don't put LOL. It's not lots of love anymore, old guy. Uh, also, IMO means in my opinion. This is for the older folks, the old guard. Uh, it does not mean integrated monetary options. Um, IDK means I don't know, not identifying kickbacks, you guys. I did not know stuff now. This is the new business world. Uh, R-O-F-L means rolling on the floor laughing. This is what we're supposed to be doing in business, but not in the old days. In, in AJ's time, it meant return on future liquidations. <laughs> O-O-T-D means outfit of the day because we can wear whatever we want now. Isn't that right? So you don't have to worry about what you're wearing, typically, unless it's Birkenstocks, but we'll get into that. Uh, O-O-T-D means outfit of the day, not outsourcing operations to, to Delhi. Um, I-L-Y... Put it in your heart. It means I love you. It does not mean insanely long yacht. Okay? <laughs> Stuff matters. Language matters. 
I, for instance, we have creameries and we have crematoriums. Okay, you, you can take your grandpa to a creamery for ice cream, but don't drop him off at the crematorium. See you in a couple hours, grandpa. Have a good time. Language matters even more now, and I, I just don't want to be this guy who's always on his phone and playing video games. And you know, I want to be modern, but I feel like there's a uh, you're, we're walking this you know dangerous. It's a dangerous game. We're walking a line because there's some people that get caught up in like you know games. Do you know those people that play games all the time? I have a bubble pop game now that I can't stop playing. I love it. I lock myself in the bathroom and my my kids, uh, you know, are pounding on the door. What are you doing in there, Dad? And I'm like, I'm just use your imagination. I'd rather they thought it was something <laughs> than, than play video games. The other day, I flew to Tulsa like a week ago, and I had to get on a plane. And I thought three and a half hours of fly time, and I'm gonna be on my phone the whole time playing bubble pop because I'm anonymous here. Nobody knows me i could do anything i want and so i i go to find my seat and who am i sitting next to a mennonite lady with a little bonnet <laughs> of judgment and and the and the dress of god and 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 i'm like she's gonna judge me i can't be that guy but he's over here sitting with my phone and she's like knitting and doing ceramics and stuff god or whatever and here i am you know being this you know opulent modern guy and i couldn't do it i couldn't get the phone out of my pocket i couldn't handle the judgment so i just sat there with burning resentment toward this <laughs> mennonite and all the mennonites i just hated you know and the, and the amish i hated them all i was just so mad and uh three and a half hours into it she pulls out her phone and starts playing farmville and i was like what are you yeah. doing <laughs> no capital n no <laughs> like i love this game we're putting up burns <laughs> but I thought you'd judge me. <laughs> so this old guard, uh, new guard, uh, gig economy conflict, this is all about jealousy. I hope you know that. Because when AJ says no Birkenstocks, it, it means at work to you. But in his day, it meant you're not allowed to own them or you're fired. That's what they told him <laughs> when he was coming up. They said no Birkenstocks means you can never be seen in them, ever. Or you're fired. He, that's why it's jealousy. He want, Have you seen his closet? AJ's closet is full of Birkenstocks. It's all Birkenstocks. <laughs> tie dye shirts and a couple of shirts with like Tupac's face on them. And that's it. His playlist, his rap, and his wardrobe is Woodstock. It's all jealousy. And it goes all the way to the highest levels. AJ and Jock, you know what they're doing? They're making uh, poor Melissa wear uh, pantsuits and, and sensible shoes on the yacht that she just moved on to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this whole thing is like, uh, just kind of like this, it, generations always collide, but in ours, it's, it's much more profound. Like my son is living in the echoes of my technology. My son, the other day, he, he noticed something. I don't even realized this was a thing he goes one hour photo he sat on the side of a one hour photo that's way too long <laughs> i was like he doesn't even does he know what that means he goes could you imagine just sitting there like <laughs> so he thought, i tried to tell him a story about uh getting stuck somewhere and i was lost and i had to hitchhike he's like hitchhiking what's that and i go uh yeah, I explained it to him. And then he goes, why didn't you just call Uber? <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't have Uber, man. We, just, we did have murdering kidnappers. We just didn't have an app for it like you guys. You didn't invent everything, smarty pants. That's SP. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel a little uh, vasily talking about art today, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> hey! Well, I on that one. I, that guy with a name like Vasily, there's no way he could have been an architect. Nobody would have taken him seriously. He had to do abstract. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, so listen, uh, what I was going to say is this collision of of generations is it will continue into the future. And um, for example. 40 years from now, we're going to have to explain to our grandchildren that we simultaneously had email and the post office. That's going to blow their mind. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, but what was paper? 
It was made from tree. <laughs> well, we're trees, Grandpa. It's not important, son. We got oxygen tanks now. Screw them. We don't need them anymore. <laughs> Why, you'd write your little letter on a piece of paper, and then you'd fold it up and put it inside another piece of paper that had a little door on it. Now, that was called an envelope. Some people called it an envelope. Those people were lunatics. <laughs> and you'd take a letter to a dangerous, uncomfortable place called a post office, and you'd wait around for hours in the body odor and the lack of eye contact. <laughs> so you finally got to talk to an angry, misshapen man who lived with his mother and had an inexpensive haircut. Now, that man would sell you a little sticker you could put on your envelope and you'd lick it and get cancer and give it right back to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's when they would deliver my letter. No, son, a bunch of stuff happened after that. Why, they'd shove it in a slot in the back wall. There were more angry people from bad families. And those <laughs> trolls had put it on an airplane. It traveled hither and yon across the country, sometimes for weeks, till someone finally discovered it was on the wrong damn aircraft. <laughs> That's when they would deliver my... No, son, not yet, not yet. That's when they would accidentally deliver it to the neighbor of the person you sent it to in the first... And that man, based on his relationship with his neighbor, would decide whether or not that scumbag was going to get his mail! <laughs> Oh, forget about the payphones, Grandpa. We love your stories. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, hang on a sec. I got a hello. It's Jock <laughs> calling me on his landline. Um, <laughs> this is the phone we use to communicate. He likes the sound of it better. He doesn't like the, the new. The new he calls it the newfangled sound. So he prefers the older kind of the car phones from the eighties. So, yeah, Jack, I'm just wrapping up the show. I gotta go. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Is that Blake? Yeah, we're almost. Yep, almost, almost done, Blake. <laughs> the phone I talked to Blake with. <laughs> Great to see you guys again. I love you. Stay Vasily. <laughs> oh man. Thank, thank you so much, Colin. It's always great to have you on. I think we're very close to the top of the hour, actually a little bit past this. So I just want to remind everyone that next week's theme at our weekly town hall will be James Vaughn. And uh, thank you. I want to give a big hand to the production crew because this was quite a challenge in pull pulling this off live from Las Vegas at the HR Tech Show. Thanks, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. Have a great day. <laughs>